This is Radio Labour. Hello, I'm Mark Boulanger. The International Trade Union Confederation, the ITUC, is the top labor body in the world. It represents about 175 million workers in 155 countries and territories. It has just released a report saying that the austerity programs being implemented by many governments are extending the economic crisis and undermining labor rights. The report is entitled, Ideology Without Economic Evidence, the International Monetary Fund's Attack on Collective Bargaining. I talked to Sharon Burrow about the report. Ms. Burrow is the General Secretary of the ITUC. I asked her how the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, had been attacking collective bargaining rights and why it was doing so. Labour market policies and the attacks on labour rights came as a third wave of the crisis. You saw the crisis uh, born and bred of corporate greed, of financial speculative greed. You then saw it turn into a bitter crisis of unemployment. And of course, while we had some hope in 2009 and 2010, initially, that governments globally through the G20 were going to take responsibility. You may well recall that uh, Gordon Brown said... uh, in 2009 that uh, never again would uh, the financial sector be in control of the real economy. That was followed up six months later in Pittsburgh where President Obama said uh, quality jobs will be at the heart of the recovery. Six months again in Toronto in 2010, you actually saw the world shift. The ideologues had won, that uh, austerity was born as a result of uh, demand for budget deficits. And of course, coinciding with that, we saw the transfer of public money into the bank. So in other words, the sovereign debt became accumulated as a result of transfer of corporate wealth or private wealth onto the public payroll. Alongside of those austerity measures then came conditionality as government after government in Europe in particular, but beyond, were forced to go to the IMF for bailout measures or indeed uh, supported by in Europe by the European Central Bank and the European Commission, the austerity measures were extraordinary. They not only slashed wages and uh, pensions and other social uh, protection entitlements, but they went to the very heart of labour rights. So you will find in places like Portugal, there's an absolute condition that says that minimum wages uh, won't go up unless uh, it's reviewed by effectively the IMF and their partners. You will find that they determine that the extension of collective bargaining to an industry sector is not possible unless there was a particular percentage of uh, businesses covered by employers and workers. This is at the heart of an attack on both the capacity for collective bargaining to distribute wealth effectively, the rights of workers generally, and of course that undermines the very aggregate demand on which you could try to stabilise and rebuild economies. I might add it's also undermining fundamental democratic provision. So we said enough is enough and if there was no empirical evidence behind the attacks on the IMF and their colleagues in Europe, we would produce our own political uh, uh, report with empirical evidence indicating that not only were labour standards rights, but in fact the uh, more equal a society through distributional tools like collective bargaining, the more likelihood of growth and the longer period of growth. Does the report provide evidence that collective bargaining is beneficial to societies? Absolutely. The report uh, has empirical evidence that collective bargaining works, that it's a core distributional tool, that it creates more equal societies and that it builds demand on which you can uh, stabilise economies and rebuild. If austerity programs are extending the economic crisis, what's the alternative? What should governments be doing? Well, the first thing we need to do is stop the austerity. Fiscal consolidation is always necessary, but let's get the cycles right and let's leverage it off growth, income-led growth, job-centred growth over time. We say the three things you need to do are invest in jobs, jobs and jobs, start with infrastructure, 
we challenged the G20 to put a trillion dollars, a trillion euro, I should say, into uh, infrastructure. That's half of what was given to the banks. That's got the biggest medium-term in, uh, multiplier impact. Beyond that, we need to look at the desperation of people, at the jobs that can be created in the care sector, equally as we can provide uh, support for communities that are quite fragmented now. And, of course, we need to include our young people. Youth in unemployment is just scandalous. You're talking, you know, 30, 40, 50, more than 50% in some European countries. So let's start with inclusion, scale up apprenticeships. Let's give our young people guarantees of work and or uh, employment in, in regard to that school to work or university to work or technical college to work transition. And of course, we want to see better social protection, particularly when you know that of all the people who lost their jobs in the crisis, 84% of them had no unemployment insurance. So the answers are there, there is money, it's simply a matter of political will. So what happened? At the start of the economic crisis in 2008, there was, there was a lot of talk about regrowing economies. Yet we ended up with all of these austerity programs, which even the IMF now says have gone too far, that they're worsening the situation. So what happened? One of the more sensible directors of the uh, IMF, a person who represents part of Europe, said to us, the, the point was always to determine what fiscal consolidation measures were necessary, but to put them in place when the recovery had uh, taken root. Well, of course, that didn't happen. And along with it, the dialogue that has been used previously by successful countries to ensure a pathway forward that had the trust of workers, of their families, of the communities generally, was not put in place. Unions were cut out of the picture, employers were cut out of the picture, and uh, conditionality born from bureaucracy and ideology without evidence was put in place. Consequently, we now have recession across the Eurozone. What is the ITUC's role in regards to international institutions such as the IMF? We have an advocacy role and uh, we have a consultative structure in most of the organisations. Certainly, I have to... Uh, indicate that there's been no lack of uh, uh, engagement with the IMF. We simply agree to disagree about the evidence of uh, the attacks on distributional uh, tools like collective bargaining. We uh, certainly have had a recent commitment as part of that dialogue from the Managing Director, Christine Lagarde, that ILO standards shouldn't be undermined. To date, they have, but if in the future they aren't, that's a good step forward. There's no agreement yet on what that means in terms of collective bargaining systems, but it's a good opening for further dialogue. We have also had a commitment from the managing director that in fact uh, minimum wages can play a role. Again, no agreement necessarily on uh, the nature of unit labor costs versus a basket of goods on which people can live with dignity but an opening for dialogue and certainly a commitment to jobs. So you saw last week at the IMF quite a split, really, in those who were indicating that perhaps it's time for a slowdown, that there needs to be a focus on job creation, that people are desperate and that it's undermining both economies and indeed, we would argue, democracies if you look at Italy or Greece last year. 